Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. So it's been a couple of weeks since the end of last year's ESC season. It's, it's weird saying last year's, but because it was only a few weeks ago. But I'm back because I wanted to give a bit of time to reflect on everything and just give a post contest review like I did last year. So this is just going to be a general summary of some of the key moments that happened this year, talking about some of those important controversial moments that happened because those have to be addressed. They're very important. And as always, please let me know down below your thoughts in general on this year's contest. I'm excited to read your comments. And yeah, without further ado, let's get straight into this. So similar to last year in my review, I always thread in an early 2000s British reality TV series into my review because that's just how I do it. So last year I did Kitchen Nightmares and this year it's going to be Airline. So we'll see how that one goes. But anyway, let's start. As per usual, I always start with talking about the hosts of this year's contest. So Alessandro Catalan, Laura Paulsini and Mika took the hosting roles this year. I thought they did a pretty good job. Of course, it, it goes without saying that every Eurovision contest tends to have cheesy jokes that reek of Stilton to the highest degree kind of thread throughout the whole four hours, which is fine. I mean, I can forgive that. But what I think they did well is that they wasn't kind of like any moment in the show where I wanted to get up and leave. So that's a plus, you know, there was no toilet break moment for me. So I thought they did a pretty good job. Of course, there was some high points in the show, such as the Volare sing along. I thought that was beautiful. And then Mika's wonderful speech where he just talked about togetherness, inclusivity. I thought that was a really nice touch as well. There was also some low points too, which I felt like we could have done without, such as the, um, well, you know. My name is Chicky. Chicky, Chicky, Chicky. And um, Mika's little Freudian slip as well. This is Holland. This is Poland. The green screen blunder. This is the last effort. The uh, porca vaca. The six, the, the six, the six porca vaca. And of course, Michael Ben David. Share the love and vote for your favorite song. Oh, yeah. Send the song you want to hear again on this stage to the final on Saturday. It was at this moment he knew he fucked up. So. Yeah, all in all, I thought the hosts did a pretty good job. And now let's move on to the technical side of things, the cameras and the staging. So, of course, let's start with something really positive. Something I really liked about this year's contest was the waterfall on the stage. I thought that looked really beautiful. It's unique. And I guess like in a couple years time, maybe in 10 years time or so, we'll look back and we'll remember kind of something about this contest will be the waterfall and also the green room being an actual kind of Italian garden theme, which I thought was beautiful as well. But of course, we'll also look back on this year because of that giant gaping hole in the backdrop of the stage, which was the broken kinetic sun. So I imagine most delegations, when they found out that the kinetic sun had lost its kinetic energy, had a reaction maybe like this. Oh, calm down, calm down. Calm down, calm down. And of course, I think some of the performances were affected by that sun, like Estonia. It was very gaping. It was very present in the background of his performance, which was kind of, it, it was forgivable, but it also felt like some of these performances would have been a bit better. I imagine Denmark as well would have had a better backdrop there if the sun wasn't broken. And it was a bit of a shame because if it was all working, if, you know, all the cogs had been turning, I think this would have looked really nice and it would have kind of added something very unique to this year's contest but because it was broken i think there was just a general kind of feeling that things weren't running as smoothly as possible but still i don't think it was totally detrimental and a lot of people tuning in on the night who didn't potentially know about the sun i don't think they would have noticed it they might have had it in their peripheral but potentially it would it would just be there and all they kind of cared about was the artist and the song and the jokes and everything so that's fine and of course every year it goes without saying that there are always going to be some dodgy camera angles in there because everything's a bit constrained there's not enough time to rehearse it's very limited very restricted so there's always going to be little slip-ups but i think this year there was quite a few slip-ups 
more than we've had in the past. So there was instances where we had camera shots coming from the wrong camera at the wrong time. So there was like random shots of, of the floor or just like a CCTV angle in the corner, which felt very jarring. There was times when the cameraman didn't shut off his his camera as he was panning out to run off the stage. So you just saw kind of like some guy quickly running away in Ronella Hayati's performance, which was funny. This is absolutely ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous. And then there was also a moment in the grand final where we had this like random shot of a chair and that was funny. I think even Graham Norton picked up on it too. It was just, it was kind of funny. And they may cancel each other out. It's a lovely shot of a chair there. Nice. And there's some more bears. <laughs> but again, you know, this is only a little nitpick. I think it's very difficult to put on a production like this and it goes on for such a long time and it takes you know a lot of effort to get everything perfect so it's forgivable stuff but it's just kind of funny to watch it as well so now let's move on to i think what most people are will be interested in this video for me to kind of discuss and this is the jury rigged results in semi-final two so I'm going to start off by just reading the statement, part of the statement from the EBU. According to the EBU, this is what they discovered. In the second semi-final, it was observed that four of the six juries all placed five of the other countries in their top five, taking into account that they could not vote for themselves. One jury voted for the same five countries in their top six, and the last of the six juries placed four of the other in the top five, and then the fifth in their top seven. Four of the six received at least one set of 12 points, which is the maximum that can be rewarded. The pattern in question was detected as irregular by the pan-European voting partner and acknowledged by the independent voting monitor, as five of these six countries were ranked outside of the top seven by the juries in the other 15 countries voting in the same semi-final, which included three of the big five, Germany, Spain and the United Kingdom. Additionally, four of the six countries were ranked in the bottom six of the other 15 countries voting in the semi-final. A jury voting pattern irregularity of such a scale is unprecedented. So this was quite shocking. I think we've never seen anything of such a scale at Eurovision before. And it really kind of put a dampener on everything for me because you'd like to think that half of the votes are at least valid because we do allow a small number of people to be responsible for 50% of that vote. Now, a lot of people don't care about the jury vote because a lot of people just tune in once for the year. But there's a lot of people, there's a small community of us who follow Eurovision for like a good five months. And it's really important that there's validity, transparency, and just people not cheating at Eurovision. And it just feels horrible. I can only imagine what the people who are processing the votes were thinking when they noticed this irregular pattern. Absolutely yeah. disgusting. So could you get somebody down here? Well, I, I we want somebody in authority down. Down. So there was just an interesting kind of recurrence of these countries being put in the top five of the votes and something that's really important to note is that all of these countries were considered to be non-qualifiers or borderline qualifiers by the bookies in the first place so there was probably some kind of arrangement going on between some of these juries and this is just speculation but what i think happened is there was an arrangement with some of the jurors that they would all vote for each other to kind of counteract the risk of them not qualifying and it didn't work in the end because well the only two of those countries that went through was Poland who was already kind of a secure qualifier anyway because their song was probably the, one of the best out of all of those countries and then Azerbaijan who qualified with zero points from the public which is kind of shocking in its own right so something truly dodgy was happening with those votes so something that kind of struck me as quite interesting was so the only country that kind of didn't have this pattern as solidly as the others was Poland, which suggests as they had Sweden in fifth and Finland in sixth and then Georgia in seventh, it kind of suggests that maybe not all of the jurors had been allegedly bribed to mess around with the results, but it feels like all of the other countries have sort of followed this pattern. And then you've got Montenegro, 
who put Serbia in the second place, breaking that little bit of a streak a little bit. And I only wonder what those other countries had to say to the jurors from Montenegro when they realised that they hadn't completely followed the agreement in my eyes. You know, I've got an agreement with you and you've broken it. OK. Yeah, you've broken it. What's you going to do about it? But then at the same time, putting Serbia in second is kind of not out of the ordinary because they're neighbours, they have a history of voting for each other anyway. But yeah, I just think I would have expected Montenegro to give the 12 to Serbia and not the 10, but they gave the 12 to Georgia, which is very interesting. How do I think this should be rectified? Well, it's a really difficult one because this kind of thing is hard to clamp down on, but it feels like Martin Ustadal, who has taken over as kind of being in charge of everything after Yono Lassand, he has a much more kind of direct approach to this. There's less kind of sweeping it under the carpet and they're saying like, when they spot something wrong, they're gonna deal with it immediately. But that's not to say that it could happen again. I just think them exposing this problem will stop people feeling like they can do this again and get away with it. Because it was so obvious, to be honest, the way that it was all put together, it's not like they could have rigged it subtly it was just like so obvious that it was going to be picked up on yes i think exposing the problem will stop people from doing it in the future as much as it possibly could have done but at the same time i just think when you give power to a small group of people to mess around with the results and then the other 50 percent goes to the public it's really badly skewed and i think the only way to there's, there's a couple of options that they could obviously publish all of the jurors' names really kind of vigorously so that everyone knows who the jurors are and it's almost like they're in the firing line. So yeah, they could be exposed. They're already kind of known people and then they might be less kind of inclined to, to cheat. But at the same time, maybe they shouldn't publish any of the jurors' names so that they can't find each other and then kind of liaise and all collude together to rig the vote. But then also I just think they should maybe have more juries. So if you have 10, for instance, instead of five, there's more people to bribe. And I don't think people will want to spend more money bribing more jurors. So if you have 10 jurors, it reduces the risk as well. And it also makes the result a little bit more valid when you have more people as well. But I think the general approach of clamping down on it is really good because it might stop this from happening again or reduce the risk anyway. So I do think the EBU handled it relatively well. They could have been a bit more transparent. I think they took a bit of time to tell us what the problem was when, I mean, it was fairly obvious, but I think they could have been a bit more transparent, but in the future, I think they learn from this and continue to make sure that this is clamped down on and it never happens again. So now let's move on to the next topic. And these are countries that I think personally deserve better in the result because from watching their performances I thought the way they placed was a bit low for the quality of performance and the song that they gave to us basically. So the first country is Romania. Now in my original review I wasn't like a huge fan of this. I thought it was pretty good but it was never kind of up there in my top 10 for instance but I still felt like they did a really good job. It was very chill and the performance was quite solid. I guess the second place in the running order was a bit of a detriment. They still secured a good televote, but I think if they were maybe later on in the show, they could have done better. So that's the first one that I felt like I would have liked to see them potentially closer to the top 10 maybe. And it would encourage Romania next year to keep trying because they finally broke the non-qualification streak. And it's great to see them back in the final. So let's see how they go next year. The next country, which I think quite a few people think deserved better was France. So Foulen was a song that I felt was in the studio version far superior to the live version. It's a very complex and intricate piece of music. I think it's one of those issues that the song itself was really hard to get right live anyway, that it's going to be difficult to get jury love for a performance that doesn't quite do the song justice but I still feel like second last is just way too low I feel like a lot of people were really 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 angry they probably felt like that's ridiculous has got nothing to that's say grotesque. and yeah it's just it's nice to see France and something very experimental that it wasn't rewarded and 
again it just feels like a lot of more of the EDM experimental tracks aren't doing as well as they maybe should same with Czech Republic and I'd like to see that change a little bit because I do want to see less middle of the road less jury bait tracks do well at Eurovision. I know we had Moldova in the top 10, which was kind of a nice surprise. Um, and I like to see more kind of unique stuff in the top 10 as well. So that's my thoughts on that. And of course, Armenia as well. I think looking back at their performance, they did a really good job. They had a nice staging concept. And the fact that this finished quite low down is quite disappointing because I really do think Rosalyn had a great performance. The song was, you know, harmless, it was really nice, it was well written, it was well structured, and I thought the staging, you know, with the interesting spinning house scenario, with all the post-it notes in the background, it just felt very unique, it felt like it stood out, and the fact that it came so low was kind of upsetting too, but you know, you can't do anything about it now, but that's how I feel a couple weeks later. And then Country Set did a bit better than expected, in my eyes, and that made me kind of happy, was firstly Estonia. So Stefan finished in 13th place, which I thought was fantastic for him. I think closing the show really helped him boost his televote score, but also he was just generally very confident and charismatic on stage, which would have, you know, secured him points anyway. I think he did a great job, and I'm really happy to see that Estonia came back to the final after missing out last year and absolutely did a great job. So yeah, that made me really happy. The next one was Portugal because they finished in the top 10. This is one of my favorite tracks of the year. It's beautiful. I listened to the live version recently where it was just all the singers and a couple of acoustic guitars in this like massive acoustic space. And it just sounded so good. Like I probably download it because I just thought the performance they had in that particular clip was beautiful. But I also felt like the staging concept they had was really unique on the Eurovision stage. The camera angle swooping down, that circular formation, the fact that this was third in the running order yet it finished really high up was just great to see as well. And I'm just pleased that they got top 10. I think it's nice to see that a more contemplative slow song with a more stripped back instrumental and more focus on chordal textures actually did really well at Eurovision if you get me. So yeah, that was really nice to see. And then the next one was Serbia and their huge televote score. I thought that that was particularly refreshing to see a song completely in a foreign language, so in Serbian, do so well across the board, across loads of different countries who some particularly don't have a connection with Serbia language-wise. They still voted for it because they got the message. They were kind of hooked into it. And that was really great to see because it shows that it doesn't matter what language the song's in, if they're able to portray the meaning to you, if they're able to use the advantage of music being a universal language, it worked. It worked and it came fifth, which is fantastic. It's their best result for a while. And yeah, I'd like to see them come back next year and potentially push for the win. I think that would be nice to see. So yeah, well done to Serbia this year. And now, Let's talk about the two countries that just missed out from qualifying to the final. So firstly, Croatia, for the second time in a row, came 11th in their semi-final. I can only imagine how the Croatian fans are feeling right now. It's a fan passport. So Mia Dimsic with Guilty Pleasure, it was kind of upsetting to see that this just missed out because although the song was never kind of in the eyes of many people and also in the bookmaker's eyes a strong qualifier, it still was nice to see that it came so close to qualifying and I know in retrospect I can see that the pre-parties in the semi-final, the vocal performance was really nice. It was almost faultless. It didn't have all the bells and whistles of like San Marino's performance. It was just very kind of stripped back, very subtle, but they did a pretty good job. And it's kind of sad to see that they just missed out. But again, I'd like to see next year them push again to qualify eventually. It's been a couple of years now. And of course, North Macedonia was the other country that finished 11th so this one was really surprising to me because I obviously thought it would come last in its semi and it actually did so much better than I thought and I of course regret not kind of putting it higher than I did but yeah I think that's really nice to see that Andrea got 
a lot of points more than a lot of people expected and as much as I still think that the performance itself like the staging the camera shots the way it was all planned out wasn't particularly the strongest of the semi I still think that the passion and the energy in her performance in terms of her singing the way that she sang with conviction and believed in all the words she was saying I thought that was great and it was rewarded respectfully I think so yeah I think also with this country like Croatia I'd love to see them push again to qualify they did it in 2019 they can do it again so let's see and now let's briefly talk about the gold silver and bronze medal entries of this year's contest so obviously we had Ukraine winning we had the United Kingdom in second and then Spain in third so it's nice to see particularly with the second and third place Spain and the UK that they absolutely flipped the scoreboard around from last year so they went from bottom to top in the space of one year just because I think they decided to take a change in the direction in the effort and in the attitude they put in towards it and obviously Spain had Benidorm Fest I think that was a winning formula they had with that they had a broad range of genres and styles in there and I think it just had a really great format and they had plenty of songs in there which could have all equally done quite well at Eurovision so that's really great to see and of course the United Kingdom signing tap management to help them find their act I think that was a great format as well I think they should stick with that and obviously we came second it's our 16th second place that's insane I think we did great and I'm really pleased and often of course Sam Ryder is now I think number one in a couple of charts here and number two in the official charts so that's really great to see you know a broad range of people buying the song and appreciating it so that's great and of course Ukraine with their third win since debuting in 2003 I think that's really good they've got such a great track record at Eurovision and I'm excited to see the plans for next year's contest where it's going to be hosted who the host will be let's see how this all pans out um yeah I'm really satisfied with the results this year closing this little discussion let's just talk about things I'd like to see next year so I'd like to see a few more internal selections from countries that have been consistently struggling to qualify such as Latvia I think they should scrap supernova and just choose something else like an internal selection focus on developed artists artists that know what they want know what their sound is so that they can have full creative control on the staging on the way they want everything to look and sound and I think they could be on to a winner so countries like Croatia as well maybe someone like Slovenia just try doing going internal and see how it happens because it's been a while since they've done that so yeah that's how I feel the next one obviously crack down on cheating like I've said previously I think it's really important that countries just try and crack down on it a bit in their juries maybe do an extensive background check an extensive kind of due diligence on the juries before they put them forward just try and do as much as they can internally to stop it happening in their own delegations before it goes into the actual contest because it's just you know it really kind of puts a drag on the validity on the transparency of the whole contest so I'd like to see a crackdown on it but I think the EBU are really trying hard to do that so that's fantastic and then something else I'd like to see more of a mix of genres and tempos and the final next year we had a lot of ballads a lot of slow tempo songs which is fine but I would like to see countries kind of not trying to send all of the same kind of themed song I'd like to see a mixture of style genres obviously that's a wish of a lot of people it's probably never delivered but yeah let's see what happens next year so I'll sign off here thanks for watching my video and of course let me know down below what you guys think and stay tuned I will be back to do a couple more videos about this year's Eurovision Song Contest and I hope you guys have a good weekend bye